You're listening to Psych Up on the Casozo Radio Network. And now your host, psychologist and author, Dr. Suzanne Phillips. Welcome to Psych Up on Casozo Radio. I'm Dr. Suzanne Phillips, host of Psych Up. My goal and the goal of my guests is to discuss any and all topics from a psychological perspective. Together with you, the listener, we want to share information, invite curiosity, and essentially make you an expert in your own life. We hear a lot these days about self-branding. What does that really mean? In the most basic way, we can think of it as what comes to mind when someone hears your name. It might be they would think, funny guy, that guy's tech smart, she's a drama queen, he's a great teacher, she's everybody's mother, she's the life of the party, he's a loyal friend. As you can glimpse, self-branding has relevance for us in both our personal and professional lives. Today, we are going to demystify self-branding. We're going to make it a usable concept that can improve your personal and professional success. To help us do this, we are welcoming back marketing and social media expert, Dr. Joel Evans. In November, Dr. Evans offered us a wonderful show entitled Social Media, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. You can access that on the Casozo site. You can access it as a podcast on your iPhones. Just search Psych Up under podcasts and you'll find that show. Dr. Evans is the RMI Distinguished Professor in the Zarb School of Business at Hofstra University in New York. He's the co-author of two major books, Marketing, which he's per, for which he's preparing the 12th edition, and Retail Management, a Strategic Approach, which is headed into its 13th edition. Both of these are used nationally and internationally, and they're available in English, Chinese, and Russian. Dr. Evans consults for a number of firms. He's been interviewed in many media formats, newspapers, magazines, radio, TV, online. Professor Evans has been following social media for the past 10 years, and teaching it on a graduate level to a to masters and MBA students. He writes two blogs weekly on marketing and retailing with worldwide following, two Twitter accounts, and manages the LinkedIn accounts for the marketing and international business departments of Hofstra University Zorb School. Dr. Evans has particular interest and expertise in self-branding. He's written about it. He's offered professional seminars, and it is one of the special new areas he has a great passion for and that he addresses with all his students, from undergraduates to executive MBA students. Dr. Joel Evans, it's my pleasure to welcome you back to Psych Up. Thank you. I appreciate that uh, warm introduction. Okay, thanks so much. Let's start. I know when you speak about self-branding, you say... It involves three important aspects. I wonder if you could share that. Well, the first aspect is us trying to determine what our self-brand is. What are we? What attributes do we consist of? The second part is then trying to convert those attributes that make us up into the message or the persona that we'd like to project to other people. What do we want other people to think about us or know Mm -hmm. about us? And then the third part is the way that people actually perceive us, uh, which may or may not be consistent with the way that we want them, that way that we perceive ourselves and the way that we want them to perceive us. You know, when you say that, I think of people who say, I'm low maintenance, and no one thinks they're low maintenance. That's not exactly how people perceive them. So I can see that one of the dilemmas here is, A, knowing who you are and somehow coming up with a way to let other people know that aspect of you, and then wondering how, in fact, it's being conveyed and if it's being conveyed. In the way that we intend, yes. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about it. Let's start with personal self-branding, and we can bring those three aspects into it. How does a person even think about self-branding? Uh, what are the kind of steps I could take if I, let's say I wanted to write a personal profile for an online dating service, what, what would I even think about? That's a good example, by the way, because that, that's a self-branding. So one of the things about self-branding is that it's situational. 
So the way you're going to describe yourself for a dating site is going to be different than the way you want your friends to perceive you. But the first thing that we really have to do is to understand what we are. What are, what are the attributes that we'd like to convey to other people? Um, what I like to do as an exercise when I talk is to say to people, I give them a pad and a pencil, and I actually say to them, write down five to ten words that describe you so that if you were interacting with your friends, what are the five or ten things that you would like them to see about you? And if you were in a um, career situation, what are five or ten attributes that you want to make sure you get across to a potential employer? So it's really trying, and, and this is a great exercise for self-assessment because most of us don't do that. Most of us don't have a, you know, an idea really of, of, of what the attributes are that we stand for. We may have this, this hodgepodge of attributes that we think comprise us, but most of us don't think about it in a, in a systematic way in terms of who we are, how we're presenting ourselves, and how we're received. So I think the first thing that we have to do is to come up with some key words that would describe us and would describe us in a way that we'd like to be perceived. Well, you know what you pick up there that I think is very true, and that is we tend not to see ourselves as multidimensional. So I can picture someone saying, I'm a nice guy, but and missing out that he's also very creative, uh, very friendly, organized, very loyal. I mean, so I guess when you start to think of five key words, it f almost fosters you thinking about yourself in a kind of multidimensional way. Right. It's like, it's like a whole person or a gestalt. But I want to reiterate it again, that, it, that it's, it's situational. So those five words are the way you want to be perceived. You talked about online dating. That's a totally different persona than you would want to have at work or that you would have with your close friends or your family. You know, there are different, there are different attributes that you would want them to focus on. Well, here's, here's where that discrepancy is very big with online dating, and I'm, I'm sure some of our listeners are interested in this. I think when people start to write their profiles, uh, so the, let's call it their self-brand profile, instead of them really focusing on themselves, uh, Dr. Evans, they are trying to second guess what someone else would want. So, right. someone say, so someone's saying, I'm very adventurous. And I say, are you really very adventurous? Well, I, I would want to ski. Do you ski? No. Okay. So in other words, it, there is a flip in which the focus is on what someone wants and it, it cuts through the authenticity because the focus is not on really their own attributes. Right. And what they're doing is they're creating a false brand, mm -hmm. which means that if the people, do, the two people do communicate or do meet, there's going to be a major disconnect because it's not who they are. It's like when so I said we have to be, we, so we have to be authentic when we come up with these keywords or attributes or this persona that we'd like others to see us. It can't be something that we're creating. As you said, it can't be something that it's because we think other people want to hear it. Yes, it it's can't be, be fictional. It's got to be genuine. It's got to be genuine. Well, the, the best example is someone who wanted to put down she was a biker, motorcycle biker. I go, are you a biker? No. But I once rode bikes with my dad. I go, well, I think you're going you're gonna to draw a big biking crowd here. <laughs> I mean, it's just what you say. If it's not your authentic self, the match can't possibly really work. But, so but we also do that all the time because we want to be liked. Yes. We want to be admired. We want to be respected. We want to get the job. Okay, so let's let's cl let's do the alternative. What are the kinds of things? If you, if you make yourself that person for a minute, what are the kinds of things that you would think about? Okay, so this is where again I, I talk to people and I talk to them a lot about that. If we're talking about a professional setting, a resume, but you could almost argue that you could have a life resume that is similar in concept, but different in purpose. Okay, and let's that is go with the, the personal one. Yeah, let's yeah, start with so, the so, so we have an inventory of attributes that we'd like to have, and then we've got a set of experiences that we have conducted, personality attributes that we have, and we want to pick out the ones that are there that represent, you know, actual, so let's suppose that you're, you know, you, you want to interact with somebody and you say you love travel. 
Mm-hmm. Well, that's one where if you traveled a lot, that's a perfect, you know, icebreaker and a way to talk to one another. Mm-hmm. It's looking at your attributes, your, your, your experiences and playing on those. So your passions, if you come from a big family and you love people, you would put that down. If you uh, really were a very active person and you were a biker uh, or a runner or a kayaker, you would in fact say athletic. If you were a great reader and you loved fiction and nonfiction, or you loved mysteries, and you, I mean, so you're saying really take a look at what your passions are in addition to your experiences. Right. And understand that just because we use the words doesn't mean that the person uh, gets the full message. So if you use biking as an example. Suppose I put down avid biker. And I really was an avid biker, but what does that mean? Am I a member of Hell's Angels? Am I a, you know, does 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 right. that part of it, you know, obliterate just my saying that I like the freedom and the air and you know being out on the road? So there are a lot of different connotations that that are with these attributes. And even if you use the word passion, so I'm you know, you're saying that I'm passionate. How do you then demonstrate that you're passionate so that the person gets that you really are? And none of us. In, in all honesty, is passionate about everything. We're passionate about certain things. We're passionate about sports. We're passionate about politics. We're passionate about social media, whatever it may be. But we're not passionate about every single one of them. So what we have to do is convey that we're passionate about certain things. So we now see people all of a sudden, because America's in the World Cup, they get, they're becoming passionate about soccer. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it's I can see why this is really not such an easy thing to do, because in some ways, yeah, because in some ways you're trying to look at the things that represent you and then in some way convey them so they have some clarity of meaning. So I might be more likely to say, if I love nature, I'm a free spirit who loves nature and not just I'm a biker or if rather than I'm a passionate person, that I'm passionate about classical music and I get passionate about most things that I do. So that in, in some ways, uh, um, the clarity with which we're starting with five key words to get us thinking, but actually in self-branding, whether it was for a personal online profile or even in ter- talking about yourself on that first date or even with friends, because some people really want to know how to talk socially with a little bit more comfort about themselves. This is a good jumping off point for those folks, too, who are a little bit socially cautious. And that is to think of, well, what really, what do you, do you really love walking your dog? Do you really love the beach? That is, when you love something, people generally want to hear about it. That is correct. But again, we could be misperceived a lot. If I can, let me tell a you know, personal story or two here. Good. I'm a big guy. Uh, I'm now a lot older than I was when I started teaching in Hofstra back in the 1970s. So when I interact with students, and I always wear a jacket and tie because I, I'm from the business school and I believe that I should represent business. So when I go in there, I, I get that I can be intimidating to students. Yet, I really see myself as a lovable student oriented guy. I do, I help them with their resumes. I help them with their self branding, with everything else. But there's a certain, you know, the way I have a certain look and it's been told to me enough times that I believe I'm being pensive and I'm thinking and I'm listening and they view it that they somehow, they look at me and see that I'm being hostile, which is the the hostile or arrogant, which is the furthest thing from what Mm. I want to be. So what have I done? I, I, I go in and yes, I'm wearing a suit, but I'm also wearing a Mickey Mouse tie. I'll mm-hmm. show a lot of cartoons. I'll make fun of myself. I'll make fun of my bald spot or whatever. In one of my classes, they, they, they thought I was so intense that I ended up drawing a frowny face and a smiley face on the board. And on the, underneath the frowny face, I wrote, this is how you perceive me. And the, <laughs> under the smiley face, I wrote down, this is how I want you to perceive me. And the whole dynamics of the class changed after that. Had they, they told laughed you, and then they got it. Had they told you they perceived you as stern and a kind of very serious? Joel, how did you know that that's how they perceived you? 
Okay, we have we have student comments that come back to us, okay. and ninety nine percent of them. I'm this perfectionist type. Ninety nine percent of it is great guy, best teacher I ever had, whatever. And then there'll be there'll be two in there out of my whole, all of my classes that'll say you know condescending, uh, arrogant, whatever. And and I look at that and I say, where are they getting that from? And I've heard. And I've heard from from people, you know, I look so stern. I look like I'm angry, and I'm saying I'm not angry. I'm really just thinking. So it's something that, you know, there are some attributes that we have that are very hard to change because Mm -hmm. if that's what I'm doing is thinking, then that's my thinking look. I'm not trying to be hostile. Um, I'd like to tell another story, which is we were interviewing a candidate for dean about 20 years ago, and, and I was on the committee, and after, the, after an interview of, of somebody, one of my colleagues came up to me and said, you know, even if you don't like the candidate, you shouldn't scowl at them. It's not polite. And I said, what? I said, that was my favorite candidate out of all the candidates. So we see ourselves in a certain way. You know, I see myself as being serious, you know, pensive, thinking, and I'm perceived as you know, being miserable or unhappy. So some things are very hard for us to do. So that's why I use a lot of humor in my interactions, personal and non-personal, because I think that humor changes that perception of me. Well, what you're also saying, it's such a great take-home message, is when you become aware that there's a discrepancy between the way you want to perceive and your authentic feeling, you're authentically feeling like I'm enjoying this class. Well, that's I'm very impressed by this candidate and people are seeing you or experiencing you as different. You didn't fight it. What you did is sort of recognize it and then come up with ways to address it. I mean, it's and the use of feedback. And we also have to recognize, and I'm in a profession where I'm interacting with a lot of people, that as much as we like, everybody isn't going to love us. We have to carve out that self-brand, do the best job that we can in interacting with people, both personally and professionally. But that doesn't mean that we're going to win everybody over, because everybody else is coming from their own experience set and their own set of, of strengths and insecurities. It's such a great point. The need to be loved by everyone is definitely a trap. You know, we're going to have to take a break. You've been listening to Psych Up on Casozo Radio.